Examples, we're live on Facebook. You can follow us there and you can share the link with everyone so that they can follow as well. If you would like to tweet about what we are talking about, you can do it by using the hashtag women in STEAM or women in science. And you can join the conversation on social media. You can share your questions. We're going to have an amazing line of very inspiring women in technology um, uh, today. So I don't want to talk too much. I'm gonna to give the floor straight away for the introductory remarks to our MEP Maria Garcia Carvalho. So please, Maria, you have the floor. Okay, I think we have a slight problem because Maria doesn't seem to be there. So we're going to move straight away to our first speaker today. She's Barbara Buade. She's co-founder and CEO of Meet Optic. And you're a physicist and entrepreneur, Barbara. After you finished your PhD in photonics in quantum and non-linear optics, you founded your own company, Meet Topics. Um, and I would like to tell us a little bit more about your personal experience and what moved you to build your own company. So Barbara, please, you have the floor. Hello, good morning, everyone. Yes, I studied physics. Uh, yes, I did my PhD in physics in this branch called photonics, which for those who don't know what it means, it's the technology of light. Um, when I was doing my PhD, I realized there were the oldest platforms that were search engines for hotels, for flights, for restaurants that I loved, like Skyscanner, Kayak. So I thought, why do I not like build something that helps me in the lab, basically, where I spent almost all my time. So we decided when I finished the PhD, we decided to build this reference platform in the field of photonics where you can go there and find any product in the field of photonics, um, search them by any specification you require for your experiments and then um, compare them amongst the different providers in the industry. The platform also provides high um, guidance towards what is the technology that you might use for your development. So that was the, the motivation and why we started building it. That's the, that's the first. And so we started two years ago and now we have more than 35,000 products and we reach 20,000 users so far. So it's quite, it's quite nice and growing and it's, yeah. So we are quite happy. We started only two people and we are seven in the team. So it's also something growing um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to even grow faster. Tell us more a little bit about your own experience yourself. Well, what did motivate you to actually build that company? So I was about to finish the PhD and then you have to decide whether you want to want to stay in science, you want to go to move to industry and what options are there. So then so in with this battle, I had a list of many ideas I wanted to, to change from society. So from, I don't know, like having a warm keyboard or like building a search engine of photonic products. And I decided to start with one of them. And that was this search engine for, yeah, for photonic products. You want it to be very hands-on. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I did my PhD in fundamental physics. And that means understanding how light interacts with electrons and matter and atoms and how the atoms move inside solids, which it was fantastic and I, I enjoyed it and love it. But at some point, the applications for my research to the real world <laughs> may, might take 50 years or never get to there. So I thought I wanted to walk around and see that I contribute to society in more like a short term impact. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing this. I think Maria is joining us now. Thank you so much, Maria Carvalho, for being here to us with uh, um, for this for this event. So please, you have the floor now for your introductory remarks. Good morning to everyone. I'm very happy to to take part on the, in this chat. 
uh, and encouraging more women and girls to pursue STEM careers is very important. Uh, it is a matter of gender quality, not only, it's also because our societies cannot afford to waste such uh, action. Um, women, no, no. women represent 52% of the European population. But uh, they only account for two out of uh, uh, five uh, engineers and uh, scientists, and this situation cannot uh, go on. Um, we know that things are improving and have been improving in the last years, in the last decade. And as a Portuguese, I'm quite proud to, to say that women in my country already represent around 60% of the researchers in the public sector. And they surpass men in five out of seven um, fields, technological and scientific fields. Uh, of course, there is a lot to, to do still in Portugal, um, especially in terms of access to the leading positions. We have a lot of PhD students. We have, uh, we are the majority in higher education, majority in uh, uh, PhD students. Uh, we are almost the same level as researchers, but when we account for uh, full professors in the academic world or leading positions in research groups, uh, men are uh, in much higher uh, percentage uh, than women. Um, but why do we increase our rates in uh, women uh, in research and uh, in STEM and also in engineer? Uh, that is mainly, uh, I would point out three reasons. Um, we have uh, for the last uh, uh, 20 years or even 30 years, women do much better in school, uh, in high school than, um, uh, than men. Um, and secondly, uh, we have done a, a lot of work in the, in the different governments after the revolution since uh, the 70s. Um, we have uh, public policies to attract to, uh, women, um, uh, very young girls. We start because you really need to start at very early age to attract young girls uh, for uh, science, uh, for mathematics, for physics, and for bio. Um, and we do that in museums, in programs for schools, uh, and we attach special importance to role models. Uh, we have uh, also along the, the time uh, several uh, initiatives to show role models in science in, in, and engineer. Um, for example, in, um, in, muse in science museums that we have along the country, in special programs for schools, uh, so we uh, uh, want to give, and we are uh, constantly giving a high visibility of, uh, to women that are uh, in STEM. Uh, and uh, being a mechanical engineer myself, a career where uh, women are still a minority, and uh, when I study, were really a very small minority. I was, uh, we were two girls in 120 uh, boys in the in my times in the, in the university, uh, and I have become a professor exactly in the same university, University of Lisbon, professor of mechanical engineer, and I can uh, speak. Uh, from personal experience. And I want to tell you uh, one small event. We have an open day for students. And when uh, this open day in the department, uh, the, the open day was led by female teachers like myself and the, the few colleagues that we have that are uh, women. Uh, and we took the, the guided tours and shows to the students that in, in those years we managed to attract uh, thirty percent of girls uh, compared with two three percent when the open uh, days are done by by uh, men professors that are men. Uh, one day in these guidance tours, one girl told me, after having met uh, met you, I think I would become a mechanical engineer. I I like the course, but I was so scared of this course. She said. I thought that all mechanical engineers were covered with dust and black suit 
<laughs> and I see that you just dress normally, you have makeup, so I will go to mechanical engineer. So this shows the importance of identification, shows the importance of role models. And uh, today we are lucky here that uh, we have fantastic examples of women in STEM from quantum physics to bio uh, to ICT. So we are here to listen to them. So I'm very happy and uh, I welcome all of you and I look forward to listen from you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria. It was very inspiring indeed to hear from someone who has experienced herself what it's like to get into a field that normally is um, is dominated by men. And at the same time, you have served as a role model for other women. Very inspiring indeed. And I agree with you. Our society cannot afford wasting the talent of so many women that could definitely be active in science. I'm going to now give the floor uh, to the member of the European Parliament, Christine Schneider. Um, she is a member of the Committee on Women's Rights and uh, Gender Equality of the European Parliament. Sorry, Elizabeth, oh, sorry, there has been a change here. Um, <laughs> it's Elizabeth uh, Vosenberg Briondi who is actually joining us today. Sorry. Can you hear us, Elizabeth? Uh, yes, back? can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can. Uh, Hello, uh, how are you doing? I, I have a problem, with, uh, sorry, I have a problem with my camera, but if you can hear me, it's okay for me. Okay, that's fine. We we can hear Is you. Is it better now? We can we, you see me now? Eh? Yeah, no. we, very uh, close to the camera indeed, but we can see you. If you can hear me, I can take the floor. Yes, of course. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. So, uh, colleagues, I would like to welcome first our experts in this really interesting discussion. I take this opportunity to say that during the previous mandate, I was the rapporteur on a special file about women's careers in science universities and glass ceilings encountered. The text was adopted by a vast majority and we all agreed in the end that the underrepresentation of women in these fields still persists. In Europe today, out of 18 million scientists, and engineers, almost 60% are men, as you know, and the rest are women. What I really want to underline is that the case of artificial intelligence, where the gender gap among professionals is even bigger. We talk about 78% men and only 22% women. Recent studies have shown that gender bias and stereotypes are so deeply rooted in our societies that they continue to influence people when it comes to uh, robots and artificial intelligence in general. The problem is that most decisions concerning this topic are made by men and most programs in this field are de designed by men. So we talk about one more male dominated professional area. In this framework, there is a number of suggestions and practices in order to overcome the gender bias, but I would like to hear the opinion of our experts, especially on how can artificial intelligence be developed to be genderless? Is that possible? And if not, how do we ensure that all uh, genders are equally represented, both in voice and visually, so that we develop a socially responsible artificial intelligence? Additionally, how can we support female founders who, went, uh, who want to start an artificial intelligence related project or a company? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. Very, very interesting questions uh, that we are going to discuss in a minute. Uh, but first, I would like to give the floor indeed to Christina Schneider. Thank you so much for being here today. She's a member of the Committee on Women's Rights and Gender Equality at the European Parliament, and she's currently the shadow rapporteur and co-author of the own initiative of the European Parliament on promoting gender equality in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education and careers. So please, could you give us a hint of what's in that report? Thank you so much. Thank you for your invitation. Uh, we need to, uh, to empower girls and women to enter STEAM fields and to study and careers, and we need to make them stay. Uh, last week I had a discussion with uh, uh, different uh, scientists and they told me that a lot of women study in the STEM fields, but they don't stay in STEM fields. So 
we have to think about how they can stay. They are always facing an unparalleled so shortage of women in science, in technology, in engineering and mathematic careers and education, particular considering that women make up 52% of the European population. And today we only account for two out of five, five scientists and engineers. This is a very un satisfaction satisfying situation there and therefore the european commission decided to tackle this problem the commission president ursula von der leyen make a clear statement women need to enjoy the same opportunities as men and every man and woman should be equality to fit contribute in the economy of the future therefore the european union will in West in programs that will encourage more girls and women towards, towards to STEM education. And in this light, the European Commission published last March the Commission on Communication and Union of Equal Gender Equality Strategy 2020 to 2025. The ambition to combat the gender market segmentation in STEM careers covers all political areas. For instance, most green and digital stops are STEM jobs. Good news is that the Euro European by now, 41% of scientists and engineers are women. But when you look at workers in high-tech manufacturing, four out of five are men. And so we have still a long way to go. There has been a positive trend in the involvement and interest of girls in STEM education, but the persons remain insufficient. This is why we are here in the European Parliament discuss an invitation report on promoting gender equality in science, technology, engineering and mathematics education and careers. I'm very pleased to be the shadow rapporteur for my political group as myself come from the STEM sector. I'm a carpenter and before I got engaged in public, uh, I make my bachelor in engineering. And uh, we talk about challenges for women in engineering. I know exactly what we are talking about because I know what, how you feel when you go in a, in a school room, there are about uh, 168 students and only two of the students are women. I, I really know how it feels it uh, for, for our women. The draft report that we are discussing exactly again in this afternoon in our FAM committee meeting covers all the wide range and aspects. Education, careers, the digital sector and the entrepreneurship and access to finance. We need to carry out a broad analytic to find out and possible reasons for the so shortage of women and girls in STEM. And we need to urgently find solution to tackle all different causes. For my political group, priority is to advance education, training, and maintenance of digital skills and capabilities with a special focus on girls through training and lifelong learning and to prioritize diversity and inclusion in STEM to engage equal opportunities in the economy and in business. Girls should be encouraged to take up mathematics and science subjects in schools. Priority is to use AO funds and programs, including Erasmus Plus, to effectively support lifelong learning and training in these areas. Priority is to create additionally and create a incentives for both companies and women for role models, mentoring programs and career path to increase the visibility of women and to promote, to promote their access to this sector. Priority is to establish company, campaigns and award for business who take exemplary measures to improve women presented in digital economy, in particular in decisions making for her. Priority is to ensure gender, impairment and age sensitive development of technology and application taking into account to end users need. 
In my opinion, it is extremely useful to offer the possibility to internships to STEM business. This will help to overcome shyness, insecurities and prejudice. This is both self-confidence and self esteem and encourage women to get engaged in STEM jobs. And uh, I think we had a very, very uh, a big way for us. And I really hope that we will be successful and create new and emerging opportunities for women and girls in STEM. Moreover, there will be many more women like Miss Barbara Guadans who will support our goals as role models. With their support, we will create interest to many girls in STEM and promote interest among all who are interested. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much. I am very glad to see that there are so many ways in which we can contribute to the presence of women and girls in STEAM and also that there is a lot of work to be done, but hopefully we have members of the European Parliament make, making their, their part. I would like to go back to, to Barbara because after listening to both uh, you and um, Ms. Maria Carvalho about how they were themselves part of this, uh, of this world that it was dominated by men, but they were inspired by other women. Barbara, did you have yourself a role model that move you into moving into science or do you feel that you can be yourself a role model for other girls and women uh, across Spain or the world? I think this is a very difficult question <laughs> to answer. So I did not have a particular uh, role model to follow. I guess uh, what I do is I, through my path, I look at different people. I try to learn from many, as many people as possible. So that means I had many, many <laughs> different role models, um, friends, but also people in the industry, people in, in as research. So my family does not have a scientific background, neither a business background, but I pick up on the way people who did have that background and that who helped me and encouraged me to continue. Do you think that you could eventually be yourself a role model for other girls as well? Yeah. I mean, yeah, of course, uh, I've been mentoring um, a few women, not a few men. I think it's important to to yeah to mentor people who are on the way and that you can also provide help to them. Can you tell me a little bit more about the challenges that you faced when you decided to move from a research path into the business path? The first challenge was to understand how business works. So basically the first thing is to understand how they communicate, what are the words they use in sales, the words they use in finance, in marketing. And then, um, because if you don't talk the same language, it's very difficult for you to learn from them. <laughs> so then that, that was the first step and probably the most challenging step to understand exactly what you don't know and try to learn from what you don't know. I'm going to turn now myself uh, to Christine uh, Maria about how do you think, because obviously already including women and girls in STEAM careers is very challenging, but even moving that to the business perspective is even more challenging. How do you think that the EU could actually help women and girls who are already part, uh, who have already moved into the career uh, path of STEAM into actually launching their own business as well and, contrib and contributing to innovation in Europe? Maybe Christine, you would like to go first? Um, uh, thank you. Um, I think for us, for the for the EPP and for me, it's it's very important uh, the role of business enterprises and SMEs in the central. And we seek to encourage and empower women to advance to and success. And the EU, EU can provide support in in I think in different ways. Uh, we need to combat uh, gender stereotypes through education and information in all fields, including business. And we need to make uh, women access uh, finance easier. And we need to raise awareness to a EU funding possibilities to receive tailored support and information. And we, I think we we need to provide for opportunities uh, for women to boast their skills, access to capital and financial support. I think these are some, some, some points I think they are very important. 
Obviously, funding is very important when you're moving into business, and I'm sure that Barbara knows about that as well. Uh, maybe, Maria, you would like to react uh, to this. How can we encourage women not only to choose the career path of STEAM, but also to move into business? Maria is there, which I am not sure anymore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I think it's, uh, it's very important to, to as I said, to start uh, in the education sector from very young age to, to give the reasons to girls for them to like mathematics, physics, um, to do things. So uh, the role of the education system is very important. Experimental work, uh, not only theoretical work, uh, is a key, for example, for girls to like engineering. Uh, but we still have to, to change some areas, for example, the ICT, we are not managing to, to, to attract as we have been doing for um, uh, mathematics and physics uh, to STEM, that has been important, but not in ICT. Uh, a, a second point is the role of the family, the role of the society and the role of media there. Uh, uh, the fact that we need to have a role uh, examples also uh, uh, by the, the media uh, and the, the, the in society, for example, the toys. Toys are important that are not, uh, for example, the games that are very male directly uh, in the ICT areas. We need to change that. Uh, so there is a role to do in all the society, both society, media, family, education. We all need to have this task to attract more girls to uh, subjects of STEM and engineering. How important it is, right? Every single piece counts to be able to create an environment where women feel comfortable in going into these fields and not only being comfortable, but they are motivated to do so. I was wondering, Barbara, when you decided that you wanted to go into a science career, was it something that you always wanted to do? Or how did you, how did you decide to move in such a less specific field? What is it that motivated you? So I, I loved physics. I love maths. So from my math teacher was a physicist and he said, well, maths are boring. Better you study physics, which are more interesting. So then I thought, OK, so let's study physics. And when I was doing um, the degree of physics, I got two scholarships to research. Then well, I got another one to teach uh, maths in, in for uh, physics students. But the, the ones that I got for research uh, like showed me how to work in the lab, how to work in an, a scientific environment. And some people in my team, although all of them were men, <laughs> some people are there asked me, uh, do you want to do a PhD? Do you want to do a master? So then just for them asking me, opened me the possibility of me thinking about it, which I never thought about it before. And it was very nice to see that they thought I could do it. So then I can do it as well. So uh, then I did my master at Imperial College in London. And there I got two offers for a PhD. So then I thought, okay, so <laughs> I don't know. I love, I love this. I love science. So let, let's move to do a PhD as well. Yeah. How important it is indeed to make people feel that they are able to do something, just encouraging yeah. them indeed. So as uh, both Christina and Maria were saying, we have to work on the early stage to make sure that girls feel that they are not only that they don't only can do it, but also they are able to do it and they can and they will. And I hope that uh, we can see those figures of women and girls in STEAM raising over the next few years. Thank you so much for joining us today and for this very interesting and inspiring conversation. I was wondering if Christina and uh, Maria, maybe they would like to have a final word, Barbara, as well, before we move into the next panel, a message that they, maybe Barbara, a message that you would like to send to other girls and women that might be watching today and they are hesitating whether to get in this career path. So I guess my career path is moving from a PhD to being the CEO of a company. So I would encourage anyone who's done a PhD, there's nothing more difficult than that. So doing a, a, a business like or starting a business is much easier because there are more people who has done it. So you can always look for who can help you. So just like my take home message would be like, 
Keep your eyes open, your ears open. Try to absorb as much information from the outside as possible, and this will let you grow faster. Thank you so much for that, Barbara. Maybe, Christine, you would like to have a final word encouraging other women and girls to join your path? so much for organizing this event. I think it's a, it's a very important step to encourage uh, women and girls to go in, in, in STEM careers. And we see women can make their way if they want, and we have to encourage them. And uh, thank you so much for the organization and for the, for the inputs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. Maybe a final word, Maria, encouraging other women and girls to join your path uh, and, and be part of this team of very powerful women. I would say that there is nothing more fascinating than uh, to do things in science uh, and engineering because it's to build a better world. It's a world that uh, does things for the good of people, for the environment, for health, for uh, the well-being of everyone. It's, you see the results and you can see that with the vaccines that we were developing, we were the scientists, you can see with the fantastic uh, evolution that we had in environment, in air quality, in water quality. So it's doing things for the others. And women are very much pushed for uh, helping the others. And there is nothing the more direct to help the others than to be in a scientist and an engineering. It's a very direct with helping the society. So go for it because you will feel happy and uh, realization in life. I think there was no better way to finalize this panel. Thank you so much, for all of you, for being here today with us and sharing your own experience. We're going to move now into a very special video. Earlier this month, we celebrated the International Day of Women and Girls in Science on the 11th of February. The European Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Culture, Education and Youth, Maria Gabriel, had a special message on gender equality to mark this occasion, which we would like to share with you through this video. Every year, the European Commission celebrates inspiring female leaders with the European Prize for Women Innovators. This award recognizes the role of women in bringing about game-changing innovations to the market and in creating innovative companies in Europe and beyond. We need to do much more to empower European women in research and innovation. And we should start today, the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. Presently, only one-third of European scientists are women. They represent 14% of the heads of European universities. And they are strongly underrepresented in innovative enterprises. This prize is a step towards changing the statu quo by fighting gender-biased narratives, by giving brilliant women the visibility they deserve, by creating role models who can inspire other women and girls. I'm proud to announce the launch of the 2020 edition of this Women Innovators Prize, and I encourage women to apply until the 21st of April. Work with us for a Europe that strives for the role you deserve. and encouraging women to join this path. And first of all, I would like to give the floor to Pernille Baez. She's a member of the European Parliament and the uh, Gender Equality and Women's Rights Committee. And I would like to ask you, um, how can the EU empower more girls to go into the STEAM career? Please, you have the floor. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for inviting me uh, to participate this, uh, this morning. Uh, on this very important uh, talk uh, on a very complex, uh, actually, question um, because it touches both culture and uh, how uh, we as human beings 
uh, no matter what gender or personal profile in life we develop through life, that we uh, express ourselves and uh, we fulfill our potential as the, uh, uh, the late um, author Karen Blixen uh, underlined in her um, novels. So what EU can do, seen from my point of view, being both uh, skilled in the beginning in a traditional uh, female uh, education profile as a nurse, but then through my 30 years of career until, until now, moving more and more into the engineering side, I have a, 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 a master's degree in, in health science. Um, I have learned that uh, what inspired me the most and also what works best um, in the levels of SMEs to ask for, for people uh, with diverse uh, uh, skills and personalities, uh, that is knowledge. It's knowledge about what creates an innovative environment. Um, what are the tools uh, to do innovation in the level of SMEs? Of course, uh, as a part of, of, of what EU can do for, for the single market is to provide um, knowledge about that information, uh, facilitate uh, sharing knowledge and best practices, uh, and to nurture uh, um, and, and to water the conditions for the healthy competition in different sectors and in between countries about how do they address the need for girls and women uh, to, to dare to risk try something else than just to do what their mother and their mother before the mother did, which was my legacy actually. My grandmother was a nurse, my mother is a nurse, and I turned out to also to be a nurse. But since uh, then something changed in my life uh, that I could uh, make that possible. And that it was a combination both of, of course, as you also addressed earlier on, um, the appearance of, of role models that inspired me to see okay, I can actually do something else than just repeating what my mother and grandmother did. And actually, if I do change uh, my way of career into a, a more broader and more um, uh, investigating uh, way, uh, then actually I can turn myself into a kind of an innovation tool, not only for me to make me feel happy, but actually also I can, uh, by having this mind shift, um, I can together with uh, a new uh, group of colleagues in a different kind of, of enterprise than the public healthcare system in Denmark, I can actually participate in creating new value. Um, so I think, yeah, uh, knowledge sharing, uh, awareness, uh, share, um, uh, 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 awareness bringing, um, and, and hopefully in a way where we do not make the narrative live uh, uh, continuously that it's, it's, a, it's a shame not to uh, go for STEM if you are a woman. Like we should not blame men for not going into healthcare if they do not do that. Uh, and that is, that's very important for me uh, still to have the fun fundamental compass and respect that every human being has the right to fulfill their inner potential. And the only thing we can do <clears throat> as a society is, is to inspire and to support through funding, uh, through knowledge, uh, uh, through uh, competition, um, uh, the, the, the um, um, the foundations uh, beneath the uh, the SMEs of how to be more innovative uh, and more agile and more curious of uh, how to deal with. Okay, I thought all my employees should be from the same same university or coming from the same uh, group in in society, but actually I can uh, um, uh, innovate uh, and 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 I can strengthen my business by 
learning how to deal with uh, also the many challenges uh, uh, there is in diversity. Uh, I mean, uh, it's it's the friction uh, that 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 gives us new, uh, maybe sparkling ideas, but there will also be uh, something that we need to, yeah, put a, put to the side, and and that's that's the fun of it. So I'm not a person as a politician who would like EU to uh, to to force the member states to introduce quotas and 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 hard hardware uh, tools. Uh, to make, uh, for example, more women to 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 go for STEM, uh, I, I want us to notch and and nurture, and and inspire. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And indeed, I think that the power of diversity that you were mentioning is very important, especially when it comes to innovation. More people with different experiences are always only going to add more value to the production of whatever of we're working on. And also what I found very interesting because it's something that I saw in the intervention that Maria, Christine, and also yourself, that it's this, this uh, idea of contributing to society by doing that work. But I think it's very genuine also for women, this need for contributing to the society and how science is basic for that. And at the same time, how it has to be a choice. Just give the chance and the opportunity for women and girls to make that choice that for so many years was not so what we just go ahead please uh, just a, a, a closing remark from my side uh, i i like that we uh, that we focus on the young generation but i would also like to say as a woman in the middle of my life with grandchildren and a young daughter of the age of 28 don't think that you have to choose uh in the beginning of your life there is time enough to do what you want also if, when you have crossed the line of, of 50 years or 60 years so i also think we should uh, remember not to make the young generation uh, be filled with stress and our ambitions on their behalf because a lot of us we have also learned that we mature by age but also by experience uh, so we also must create a, a labor market and uh, education and research surrounding uh, that makes it possible for people to to shift uh, their educational uh, and career path also in uh, the middle age of of life i think that's important also because we get we get fewer and fewer and older and older as europeans so we really need to to make people like Maria and, and, and me and Christina to keep on going for many, many years uh, ahead. And maybe not like politicians uh, until the end, but maybe something uh, quite different. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I think it was a very, very powerful and very important message to send. And, and indeed, the question of the flexibility of the labor market, it's, it's one of the exactly. biggest discussions in the EU. Indeed, I would like to move to a young generation, though. <laughs> right now, I would like to introduce Sarah Valdes, she is a PhD student in biomedical science. When what would you, I would like to ask you, when is that you wanted to be when you were growing up? You were already sure that you wanted to dedicate your life to study brain cells, or it was actually your own experience in education or a role model that moved you into this career path? Thank you. Yeah. I think if you would have asked me when I was in primary school what I would like to become, then probably I would have answered um, teacher because these were the role models at that time. And it's only during secondary school when I had biology courses and so on that I got more interested and curious on understanding how the human body works. So that's how I actually got into science during secondary school. I got interested and then I realized, okay, I want to continue with this. And that's why I decided to study um, biomedical sciences at the university. And so I, for the, then I didn't really have a specific role model, but it was one of my colleagues during my master thesis, um, a female colleague who did a PhD. She mentioned, mentioned to me, oh, Sarah, would you consider doing a PhD? And I thought, okay, I enjoy doing this research during my master thesis, so I would like to continue um, and then she mentioned, okay, did you ever hear of the Marie Skodowska Curie actions? And I honestly never heard of it, but these are funded programs from the European Commission and they're for different stages in people's career. 
Um, and I applied for an innovative training network for early stage researchers. And that's actually how I got to this PhD right now. And I got interested in biology. I got interested in the functioning of the brain, but it didn't, have, it didn't really have to be specifically brain cells. I was working on brain cells during my master's, but now I move to a subject related to the brain, the blood brain barrier, but not the brain cells itself. So it, my, my interest moved during the years. And now with being in this training network, I also got more knowledge on toxicology. And that's how I'm now interested in, in continuing my career in toxicology. So it moved during the years. And now being in this training network, there are multiple role models, or I really admire the 14 other PhD students that are in this network. And so that's how I'm learning to continue in science and looking forward to continuing in science. Thank you so much for that. I found very interesting. First of all, that you mentioned the fact that when you were a child, your only role model at the time was the teacher, because I completely can't relate to that. And also how, as Barbara, because you were offered a choice, you thought, oh, maybe this is actually something that I can definitely do. And very good to see that there is, because we often talk about role models as someone who has already done something you might aspire to do. But it's also very important, the support that women give each other when they are in the same file and field, because that way, they can empower themselves, right? Like what you were telling us about other students who are following the same career path as you do. Yeah, yeah. we we are actually right now in this project, um, this training network. We are with um, 12 women of the 15 PhD students. In biomedical science, there are often a lot of women. So it, these 12 women also reflected the, the gender of the applicants. So there's a great amount of people that's interested in doing a PhD in such a training network. And I feel lucky that I got the opportunity to do this. And in the meantime, we're from such a diverse background. We're from 12 different nationalities. We speak 27 different languages. And this diverse environment also makes it we can learn a lot from each other. I'm going to ask you now about the challenge. Is it there is any challenge that you face uh, during your career path, during your decisions to move into a PhD that you felt that it was related to the fact that you were a woman because you were confronted to maybe barriers that some of the people might have not faced? Um, I think I'm, I'm quite lucky to that respect. Um, I applied for a couple of PhD positions in Belgium, but it was I didn't get them not because of um, being a woman just because of um, being o other uh, requirements for these positions. And then besides that, during my PhD itself, I'm, I think we have a very supportive network. So I've been, it's great that I've been able to start this PhD, but it's also a challenge. Um, the, the coordinator of these networks keep on telling us that um, we have 15 PhD students, but there were so many wonderful applications, they would have loved to hire more people. So this funding for these training networks remains important. And I'm lucky to have gotten this position. Um, but yeah, it, it remains a challenge, I think, for other people. And I think for me, I see now that I will have a challenge during the next year to continue in science and always almost finishing my PhD. And it was already very inspirational to hear, for example, how Bar Barbara got from her PhD in creating a company. And that's for me um, the next step for which they also try to prepare this, us in this training network because we had workshops on entrepreneurship and wor workshops on career development and so on. So they try to equip us um, for this next step. And in the meantime, I also know that I can come go back to these people that I've worked with in this training network to ask them for advice and support in the next steps that I would like to take. It's very good that you talk about your own program because it's EU funded and I'm sure the MEPs are following this, uh, this uh, chat are going to make sure that that funding stays there in the coming years. We're going to move now uh, into our last panelist. Uh, she couldn't unfortunately join us today live, but she has sent a video for us. She's Joanne Sweeney. She's a former journalist and a digital content creator and the CEO of the Digital Training Institute in Ireland. 
she has uh, some last minute issues, as I said, so she couldn't join, but in this video, she's answering the question, why did she decided to set up the Digital Training Institute and how she can contribute to empower women in tech through this institute. So here it is the video. What inspired me eight years ago to launch Digital Training Institute was that the realization that digital literacy and digital skills were not mainstream. As a former broadcast journalist, I've always had an interest in communications, but I realized back in 2007, 2008, that there was a sea change in communications and that social media was becoming more dominant. If we've learned anything from the past year because of COVID-19 is that the world needs to be online to engage, to communicate, to influence, and to advocate. As a woman in STEM, I guess I realized that I could empower not only other women, but other organizations and businesses to really maximize their own potential. There are no borders for business when it comes to the world off the internet. I'm even working with radio stations here in Ireland and teaching them where they can step in online and they can take news from on air to online. And of course, everything that we promote is around social media for good and the safe, savvy, ethical use of the internet and really putting digital citizenship at the heart of what I do. It also led me to write a number of books around the digital divide, but also around how government and public sector we're using social media and digital tools in order to communicate with citizens. I had an interview and a conversation with Tom Cochran recently, and he's the former chief digital advisor to Barack Obama. And 11 years ago, since Barack Obama was took up office, and when he took up office in the White House, he said that he wanted to promote an open and transparent government and deliver public services that the people wanted them to deliver and not how they wanted them to deliver. And Tom maintains to this day and in our conversation that social media is mainstream media. And whether you agree with that statement or not, you have to understand that the data does not lie. There are more people in the world right now who are using social media than are not. We need people who speak truth and who speak with based on fact, research and evidence to join the internet and to make sure that their content, their voice and their words have a legacy online. We are currently going through the biggest revolution that the world has ever gone through. The digital revolution is faster than any revolution that's come before us. So I'm inspired to equip people with knowledge, with skills, but also with the understanding that it's really a personal responsibility. It's a corporate responsibility. It's even a, a responsibility within families that we understand digital, that we, we see technology as an aid to growth and we see technology as an aid to simple communications and conversations at a time when we're locked down in our country because of coronavirus. And so that inspires me to make a difference. And let's face it, I am based in the West of Ireland. I am a, a small business and I am able to trade, to connect, to network and to do business with people right across the world who discover me. And we are brought together by a shared interest in terms of teaching people about digital, about social, about transformation. And so I'm empowered also as a business owner and as an entrepreneur to be able to grow my business and to scale my business by leveraging technology. And I can do it because yes, I know how, but I don't have the fear. And I really believe it is the fear that takes away the opportunity for people to grow, to expand, to scale, and ultimately to be successful in whatever, whatever area of society they are working in, whether it's politics, whether it's policy, whether it is government relations, or whether it's business, not-for-profits, 
advocacy around key topics. The internet can play a part for all of us. It's a shared space and we need more social media for good. We need more good actors there to make sure that the world becomes a better place and that the narratives, the discussions, the stories that we share inspire people for good and not for the wrong reasons. I would like to empower and to encourage more women in STEM. Technology is broad. Technology is not just software engineering. Tech can be tech education, the sector that I'm in. And honestly, there are so many opportunities for, for women and girls. And I have a daughter myself. She's an accountant, but also she loves the tech aspect of her job. And within her company, she's the go-to person now to, to, to get some feedback on the technologies that they're introducing. So you don't have to be a mathematician, a statistician, or even a coder to be involved in tech. Tech is all around us. In fact, when we have a, a mobile device in our hand, those mobile devices have 250,000 patents within them. And even having this conversation today and being here with you allows me to, to spread my word, but also to have a conversation with a global audience. So social media for good, tech for good, let's take away the overwhelm and let's encourage and build up women and girls who perhaps think that tech isn't for them, but tech is much more than just software development. And also look at the role that technology has played in saving lives and in producing a, a vaccine for us and the ability for us to scale the distribution of that vaccine around the world. Thank you so much, Joan, for that video. Indeed, we haven't talked so much about women in tech, but indeed the gender uh, digital gap is one of the uh, core elements of the agenda of Commissioner Maria Gabriel. So I am sure that we could uh, talk about this for a very long time, but we are running out of time, unfortunately. So before we finish, I would like to give the floor back to Sarah and I would like her to send a message to all those girls and women who are hesitating about whether or not to join this path so that they actually make the final choice and join this club of powerful women, as I said before. I think the most important thing is believing in yourself and surround yourself with um, encouraging people, motivating people. And that's what I experienced with by being in this training network, by having a great supervisor who supports me and go for it, give it a try. If you're curious, if you're interested, why not? Thank you so much for that. For to finalize this uh, this coffee uh, this coffee chat, I am going to rephrase something that Joanne said, which is that it is fear where it takes opportunity away. So dare to do it, be bold, and join this club of powerful women in the career path of esteem. Thank you so much for everyone for joining us today. It's been a pleasure hosting this event, and thank you to our amazing panelists and their, for their inspiring uh, stories and messages. So be bold, join the team career, and thank you so much. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.